but anyway, I, I give it a brief introduction with just Matt's getting that set up. So yeah, I'm Spencer. I'm one of the project managers on the quantum computing side. And today we're just going to talk a little bit about kind of quantum cryptography, which is a really very interesting application of quantum systems. It doesn't involve a lot of mathematics or complex gates. So it's, I find, think it's going to be a good introduction to see that even without a lot of knowledge or without a very complex system, it's a good way to have a very useful and applicable kind of system and a very useful kind of application that I think you guys will find fairly cool. So essentially, yeah, the main three goals I would say that I want people to take away from this is one, to kind of learn a little bit about obviously quantum cryptography and how you can make a system that is uses quantum principles to distribute like cryptographically secure keys, which we'll talk about what that means, but to do that in a very in a secure way. Second one is to kind of work with a bit of quantum code and like kind of be, see how quantum systems can actually be coded and created, which I think is very interesting and something that you may not know, but we'll do that in Python. And there's some fill-in kind of workbooks that we'll walk through. And then the third one is to kind of, I guess, give you guys the knowledge base that you may need to move forward and look into this more on your own and even look into other systems. So awesome, Matt, thank you for getting that set up. Sorry for the delays and technical issues, you guys, but I guess we can just jump right into it. So yeah, essentially, what is quantum cryptography? So there's quantum cryptography is basically using quantum principles to have classical cryptographic systems work. So it's basically what you can do is there's a, a misconception about maybe what quantum cryptography or post-quantum cryptography, the difference between those and post-quantum cryptography is like algorithms that are quantum secure, so they can't be broken by quantum systems. We won't talk about that today because that's something that's even far beyond my um, level of knowledge. It's something that the US government is like currently investigating how you could do this. So if you're interested, you can look into it, but it, I will warn you it is very, very complex. But instead, we're going to talk about how you can use quantum behavior to have a cryptographically secure system that is like theoretically cannot be broken. And so what it does is you use quantum behavior to distribute completely secure keys, which is why in addition to be calling quantum cryptography, this is also called quantum key distribution. So, and then you can use these keys in one time pattern cryptography, which is essentially where you have a message of length n and a key of length n and you use some sort of result or some sort of um, basically function to encrypt the message using that key. So an example would just be like an XOR where you like, where you just take each bit and you do a bitwise XOR on each key. And although I, I won't show you proof, this is like proven to be completely secure. So it's unbra unbreakable. And yeah, so that's basically the general idea. And what we're trying to achieve with the system is to create some sort of quantum system, quantum <laughs> principles that can have something that cannot be broken and that cannot be, and that you are guaranteed to have it be secure. So that's just what we're going to try and achieve. I guess Matt, we can get Yeah. So then, so what is the prerequisite information? So Matt, Matt went over everything that you guys need to know now, Matt just went over. So it's not a very complex topic technically, but essentially you want to know that a bit is a method of storing information in a classical computer. So oh, it's, it can have either a value of zero or one. And this is just useful because this is how we're going to encode like information or messages is that you, you encode it in the form of a bit, which is just how a computer sees things. And then the key that we're trying to create is a bit, is a key of bits. So it's essentially it is a, like is it, it is a like key of length n that is made up of bits which are zero and one. The other thing to note is that quantum measurement, so it's basically this is the act of attaining the classical bit from a quantum qubit. So one thing of note that I don't think Matt mentioned but is important, very important to the system is that measuring a qubit necessarily collapses it into the actual state into the classical state that you measure. So this, this what does that mean? What is it means that if you have a superposition of states, then you measure in a, like a state of zero. If you measure it again, it will always be zero. So it will actually collapse the qubit into state zero. So this is just means that like measurement, while it is a random event, it and without necessarily a way of determining the outcome beforehand, it will necessarily deterministically collapse the qubit into that state. And then the other thing I've noticed is that there are quantum bases, so different bases. So the conventional one is just kind of like the zero and one. And these are just based on the eigenvectors of the system, but I don't think that's really important. It's just important to understand that 
there are different weight bases that you can measure a system in. The conventional one is the Z basis. If you measure that, it like a qubit value of one will always measure a classical value of one, and a qubit value of zero will always measure or a classical value. But there's also an X basis, which is created by applying like a Hadamard gate, like Matt talked about, to qubits in the Z basis. And essentially what that means is it's kind of just rotates uh, along a sphere such that when you measure it, if you have a like a qubit value of one in the Hadamard basis and the like the Z X basis. If you measure it, there's a 50% chance that you measure a zero and 50% chance you measure a one. And so that's just the definition of that state. And that's just something that we, these are really the main pieces of information that we're going to use to talk about a, a quantum key distribution. Yeah, so basic quantum key distributions, we're just going to go over basically the algorithm and the steps that are taken to distribute a key. So just keep in mind that the goal of this is to create a key of a certain length that no one else knows. It's basically between you and someone you're trying to communicate with. It's, it's completely secure and secret. So even if there's someone listening on like the line that you're passing information, because it's kind of meant to be a communication system. So even if someone's listening in and observing all of this, they're not going to be able to know the key that you guys eventually come up with. Or if they do know the key, you guys will be aware of that. So that's the idea with this. So I guess we can just go into the actual algorithm. So the, the general people that are used are Alice and Bob. Alice is trying to communicate a key, a message to Bob, and they want to create a secret key for that. So essentially, Alice is going to generate n classical bits and n quantum bases. So these are random. It should not be deterministic. It should be just randomly generated. And what this really looks like in more like concrete terms is you're generating n classical bits, so just zero and ones. And then quantum bases, if you're measuring in the x and z bases, you want to want to, you can just equate them. You can just, I'm going to generate n zero and ones again, and then have a zero be, it would be equivalent to like an X basis and a Z and a one be equivalent to the Z basis or vice versa. And so that's just a choice that they can make. But essentially what happens next is you encode the N qubits with the classical bit value in that basis. So what we'll, when we go over the code, we'll look at exactly what steps you would have to take to do that. But the idea is that you create a qubit that somehow holds in that basis the value of the classical bit. So if it's in the Z basis, so the normal, you would create a qubit with a value of one. And so, and if you had a classical bit in like the X basis and you have a classical bit of zero, you would create one in the X basis that has a value, value within that basis of zero, which you just do by kind of first applying a Hadamard gate to a qubit already in the zero state. So that's, uh, so basically, that is how you create these n qubits. And then Alice is going to send these n qubits along an unsecure channel to Bob. So this is a channel that anyone can be listening to, anyone can be overseeing or observing. And so then what happens is that kind of Bob is going to randomly choose n bases just the same way that Alice did. So just randomly choosing them and measure Alice's qubits in those selected bases, giving him kind of n classical bits. So the idea, the fundamental principle behind quantum key distribution is that if you measure a qubit in the basis that it is in, you are going to necessarily get the classical value that Alice had. So if Alice encodes a qubit in like the Z basis, and then Bob measures that in the Z basis, he's going to get the same classical value that Alice did. And that's just because if you measure something because of the probabilities where if you have a qubit, like a qubit in the state of one, and you measure that, it is basically defined as having a 100% probability of measuring one. That's like the, the basic definition of that. But really, the important thing to understand is that measuring in the same basis is going to necessarily get the same result as what Alice encoded. So then after that, basically what has happened is Bob now has a sequence of n bits, and it's not guaranteed, and it's actually not going to be the same n bits that Alice has but there's going to be the same bits that they have when Bob measured in the same bases that Alice encoded in. So in that way, they both release onto any unsecure channel. So this is something that other people can look at. They both release the bases that they use to measure in the code. So they know which bits that they choose those same bases for. And then they basically just take and they take those bases and they, those bits and they take the ones that they measure the same thing. And those are going to form the secret key. And so that is the entire kind of algorithm. And we'll go over when, like, why this is actually secure. But the main ideas behind this is that Alice generates n classical bits randomly. 
she then encodes them into n qubits using a random basis and then sends it to Bob and he measures in a random basis. And then whichever basis that they used that were the same, they're guaranteed to have the same classical results. And so they use those bit, bits to form a key. So yeah, if you, so yeah, now we can just kind of go and yeah, and you can see that the screen just is a little, you know, a little bit, but yeah, so this is kind of just an example of maybe how you could send a message of z zero into that. So what you can do is if Alice wants to send zero as a her bit and she's randomly selected X as the basis, she would then apply a Hadamard gate to it to translate the qubit into that basis. It's a, it basically just puts them into a super position with each other. But another way of thinking of that is just putting it into the same basis. And then if Bob chooses the same basis of him as another X, he will apply a Hadamard gate and then measure. And because they chose the same basis, they're guaranteed to get the same result because essentially their operations kind of undo each other or they, because they're, they're, in this case, it's its own inverse. You can basically it undoes that and it allows them to measure the same thing. So then if Bob had chosen or randomly selected the Z basis, he wouldn't apply a hybrid gate and he would get a 50% chance of getting a zero and a 50% chance of getting a one. So it's, it could be different and it could, it would, could change the kind of the result of that. So then in this case, because when they both release all of their bases, they measured in, they can see that they've chosen the same one and then they can therefore know that they, that they have the same result. And this would be one of the bits in the key. So I guess it's very nice and it's pretty easy to discuss. Uh, oh, we're just kind of like going and we're just sending things and we're sending bits and no one's listening. So it's fine because it obviously is secure because no one's listening. But the main idea with behind quantum key distribution is that even with an adversary listening in on a key channel, like the channel that they're sending the qubits, someone can be looking at those qubits. They can play with them. They can measure them. They can change them. And their Alice and Bob will still be able to either one, have a completely secure key or two, they will know if someone has listened in and it, the key was compromised. So in that way, they'll kind of be able to see exactly what has happened and the key that they'll get, they'll be provably secure. And so we're just going to go over the steps of kind of like an adversary Eve. So this is kind of, we introduce an adversary there. It's commonly within this, like the reign of cryptography is called Eve for eavesdropper. And Eve is going to basically intercept and measure the qubits sent by Alice. And the goal of Eve is to basically yield in, and get information about the secure key. And to basically, they're trying to intercept it. They're trying to get uh, some knowledge so that they, they can later intercept messages and dec decrypt them. So essentially, because Alice is encrypting in random bases, the best Eve can do to try and measure the same, to try and measure and find out what classical bits those were, is to just measure and random bases as well. And so if we recall back, I mentioned in like the prerequisite that when you measure a qubit, it necessarily collapses into that state. That is actually kind of what happens when Eve measures. So when she measures, there's like a fundamental change to the qubit such that when she measures a classical bit value, it will collapse into that classical, into that kind of like classical value. It still will be a, obviously a quantum bit, but it will have that value. And if it's measured subsequently, again, you're guaranteed to get that classical value that Eve measured. So essentially what happens is when Bob measures the qubits, there is a chance that Eve's measurement has basically intrinsically changed the qubit such that he's going to measure differently than Alice, even if they use the same basis. And we'll go over kind of a, an example in the next slide of how that may happen and kind of what that would look like. But essentially what it is, is just based on the quantum principles. If Eve chooses a different basis than Alice does, Eve is not guaranteed to get the same classical value. And then, Bob, even if he uses the same basis as Alice, it still could have like that impact of having kind of like of causing him to measure a different value. So basically what they do is Alice and Bob will release small portions of the key to like kind of on an unsecured channel to everyone, which they'll compare. And if they're the same, those portions of the game, they can be basically like statistically confident and they can be like, they know that it is going to be the same. Whereas if they can see that there's differences in their keys, they'll know that the message has been compromised and they can discard all those bits and either try again or whatever procedure goes for next. But yeah, this can be, it's, it's a little bit kind of like weird. And I know when I was learning about this, 
it, it found I found it difficult to visualize like how is this happening. So hopefully I'll just give a concrete example of how this may happen. And without thinking too much about maybe the like the math behind it or what's happening at the basis, you can understand the theory and like the principles of what's happening, the kind of the ideas of it. So essentially we'll use the same like measurements as the last example. So Alice is going to be encoding a zero in the X basis. So she will take, like we saw last time, she'll take, she'll apply a Hadamard gate. She will then take the Hadamard gate and she will like send that encoded qubit over to Eve. And so that, what will happen then? So Eve has chosen for this example, for the purposes of this example, has chosen a Z basis. So like when I gave that example in the Z basis, you know that a qubit that as Alice has constructed it has a 50% chance of measuring a zero and a 50% chance of measuring a one. So in this kind of like convoluted example, we can say that Eve has measured a one. So in that case, the like the qubit itself has collapsed to the state of a one. So no matter what Bob does with it moving forward, if he's going to measure a one. So therefore, even though he chooses the same basis as Alice, he's going to measure a one because Eve's like measurement has changed what the basis is. So you can see that this isn't going to happen every time Eve looks into a basis. Like for instance, if Eve had chosen the X basis, like Alex had, Alex had, then Bob would also measure a zero. If Eve had chosen the Z basis, but had measured a one, which is like a 50% chance, then Bob would still, sorry, I'd measured a zero, then Bob would still measure a zero. So this, this is only like one case. It's a, kind of like a, out of all the cases, there's a 25% chance per measurement that Eve, that Eve kind of has the same result. So over a lot of, over releasing enough bits, you can have a, a very secure implementation. I think like statistically, if you release like 15 key bits, you have like a 99.5% chance of if they're the same, then there's no one listening. If you release like 50 bits, then there's like an, an even higher chance. So basically you, you just become statistically confident and it's like provably confident that no one is listening based on the more bits of the key that you release. And you have to know, understand that for these bits, a message would have a lot of bits is even if it's a short string of information. So releasing like 15 or 50 bits of a key is not a difficult task to do. And that's not something that would be like overly um, detrimental to the actual key. So I, I guess we'll just move on now to kind of talking a bit more about what this looks like in real life, because this is a system that does exist. Like you could go out and you could purchase a, like you could purchase from a company a quantum key distribution system. Like this is one of the actually applications of quantum computing and quantum technology that does exist in the real world. So that's kind of why I wanted to talk about it and introduce you guys to it because it's a very practical example, but it is something that it can be used and it is used to securely distribute cryptographic information. So essentially what happens is that the qubits that we've kind of abstractly talked about, they're just photons. They're just kind of like, so photons just basically just kind of like the elements of light and they're measured in instead of like the X and Z basis, which is kind of just abstractions a little bit there. It's, it's more fundamentally, it's based in like the polarization of the light photons. So it's measured in like horizontal and vertical or like diagonal bases are, are the two ones. So, and the, like polarization, it's really just kind of like they're your sunglasses. If you have polarized sunglasses, it separates out the light based on kind of like what polarization it has and what, um, and that's just based on like kind of the, the waves, but you don't really need to understand that for the purposes of this. It's just kind of a know that systems like this do exist and they do exist in practice too, which is, I think is really cool. So another thing is that if it, as it is a real system, this is something that there can be errors and there are errors. This is something that definitely you guys will see if you work on quantum projects this year, that quantum systems have a lot of error because it's such a small scale. so precise and trying to apply different gates and do things like this is going to induce error. So error can occur like during midterm vision measurement, and really the application of any quantum gates. So in this model that we kind of this simple model that we just talked about, if you think what would happen if when Bob was measuring, he had like an error in, had, in his measurement and he, so he measured the wrong thing basically. Well, then that would just be interpreted as someone listening in, even if they weren't. So they'd have to disregard the whole key. So it becomes very impractical. Even if you had like a 1% chance of an error for each kind of bit you're transmitting, which would be excellent. Like that, that's, probably above the standard that most quantum systems will have, then for like a key length of hundred, you're likely to have an error. You're likely going to have to disregard the whole key. So then it becomes important to kind of have error correction. And this isn't something that we'll go too in depth in today, 
just because it's kind of a, it's kind of, I think it's outside of the scope of kind of what you want to learn just about starting out with quantum computing, but it's really just kind of, there's are ways to correct the errors without releasing the entire key just by doing basically the parity of the key. And if you guys want to learn more about this, I can totally point you guys in the direction of some great resources about it, but it's really just, you kind of measure the, how many ones are there and you release that information for like a subset of the key. And then based on that, like they can see did the number of ones like line up in each in each one like is it even or odd and then based on that they can release like one bit of information and have that be corrected and once again like not it's i know what i did i don't even fully understand the kind of these cascade protocols because they are fairly comp complex as it's called but definitely the more important thing is to understand that quantum error does happen but there are systems and that we can use to correct those and yeah just like i said the yeah quantum key distribution systems exist. You can go and purchase one if you want. They, they're very expensive, but they're right now kind of limited to short distances just because of kind of just practical implementation, like implementation problems and things like that. But this is something that obviously like quantum teleportation and like entanglement is the possibility of solving. I'm sure you guys will, will learn a lot about that for like kind of Grover search algorithm and kind of maybe in the hackathon stuff that you do tomorrow, you'll learn a bit about like, or like explore entanglement and possibly even teleportation. But yeah, do you guys have any questions about any of that kind of material or anything we went through? I know this is definitely overwhelming for sure that there's a lot of information coming at you at once, but I would say the main takeaways isn't necessarily that you understand every little nitty gritty, gritty detail because there'll be time you can go over like the work quick and things like that, but it's more that like you guys understand the, the ideas of it. So if you definitely if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat right now and I can address them. Yeah, so it, yeah, this requires Alice and Bob to trust each other. So the idea is that is that it's like any cryptographic system where Alice is trying to send Bob a message that is secret. It's a secret message. And so they they kind of are somehow working together and they trust each other in terms of the input. So yeah, they, they there does need to be like some sort of like trust and working together without Alice and Bob, but they are usually trying to like accomplish the same, the same goals and do the same things. But yeah, that's a good question, David. Anything else? And for sure, definitely in the kind of the in the Camp QMind like workbook that you guys got, there's a section on all of this that goes through in a, maybe a bit more technical detail and a bit and the in maybe a different manner, kind of what I just talked about. So feel free to go and look through that to try and solidify some of your knowledge. And I guess just in the time left that we have, there's some code that's written already that we just need to fill in a little bit sections of that will basically create a cryptographic system and a quantum key distribution system. And so, yeah, this is the GitHub link. So go, you can go ahead, there's instructions on the GitHub to go through and download that. I'm gonna try and screen share again so that we can walk through the code together. Otherwise, uh, I can either talk about it or Matt can always pull it up. But anyways, yeah, take a second. This is written in Python and it is a Jupyter notebook file. So if you guys haven't gone done that before, you may need to kind of download Python, but there's information about that on the GitHub. And in terms of running Jupyter, if people don't have Jupyter Notebook installed, all you need to do is go basically through the command line to whatever system you're using and go through your command line to terminal and, or at least for, for me, because I'm on a Mac, but through terminal, oh, Matt's just showing, that's excellent. Yeah, it's just showing, this is the GitHub, so you can pull that from there. There's instructions online of how to do that. And then for running Jupyter Notebook, you can just kind of, once you have Python installed, you can just use pip3 to, and just say pip, like type enter a command of pip3 install Jupyter, and we can sh show that. And then running Jupyter Notebook is just typing Jupyter Notebook, but it's also that there we'll post the completed version here. So if you are having trouble, we'll post like the completed version of the code on GitHub. After, so if you're having trouble running that, or you're having trouble kind of getting Jupyter Notebook set up, don't worry about that. We can always help you later, and then you'll have time to go through and play around with code. And, there's definitely things within it that are that we will not explore right now. Kind of like there's noise that we can build in, things like that. But essentially, this is the screen. This is that right here. I think likely what we'll do is just I'll just talk through what you would write and kind of explain what the syntax would look like, and then we'll post solutions so you guys can see and then play around with the filled version. But if you guys have any familiarity or you feel like you know what may need to be done, feel free to go ahead right now while I'm talking through. What the code looks like and to go through and kind of and fill it in yourself because it's just at the bottom but matt if you want to just go to the top i guess we'll just try and get this done 
you know, before 12.45, so you guys can go off and have time for lunch. But essentially, this is the goal. This is just to implement a simple quantum key distribution system. So you have here in the first block of code is all the import statements. So the language of kind of quantum computing, at least the one that is used for this example, is Qiskit. So it's, um, it's run, and it's essentially just a Python library that you can do quantum computing in. And, it, even, and in this case, it's a simulation tool. Like it's a simulator. You can run Qiskit through like an actual quantum computer, which is very interesting. Like you can do that through the cloud. You can call a quantum computer to IBM, but this is all simulated. So it's all just kind of like simulating what a quantum system does just because it's such a small scale of a system that you should be able to do that fairly easily. So yeah, if you're, go you're going through and you can see, basically I I've defined Z is as zero and X is one just for like convention and ease, ease of developing things, but those are just the bases that we'll be measuring it. So if you can recall the measurements and the encoding, and then a lot of this code is just kind of back and stuff that you guys don't need to worry too much about, like the simulation. This is just setting up a circuit and it's setting up a simulator. A noise function is something we won't explore, but there is capability to kind of have like percent of noise is and to see if there's going to be and to have noise in your model. And you can guys can look through and see how that would affect the actual communications. But that that's just to set up that capability. The trash different is, is a very fun named function, but essentially what it does is basically looks at the bases that have been released by Alice and Bob and will get rid of any bits in the message that don't have, that didn't use the same basis. So this is just kind of the final step that you'd use of, it's just, the, <laughs> it's a good looking dog, but yeah, it's the first, the final step of kind of, I guess, taking the message and then turn that into a secret key. So then the, <laughs> the encoding of the message is, this is just kind of to another backend thing where you basically turn like the individual bits and the bases into the message, but we'll go over the actual encode. You can see that QC is called, calls a function encode qubit. And that's what we're going to be completing like that and a measurement and a measure qubit function. Cause those are the actual like quantum aspects of the system that aren't just kind of like classical communication or things like that. So yeah, and then in the next one, it's a measure bits function. You can see the measure qubit function that's being called and set to equal the qubit. And that will essentially, that is the one, another one that we'll be completing that is measuring the qubit. So the encoding is when you go through and you encode like the bits that Alice generates as like quantum bits, as qubits. And then the measurements is the like, how do you measure it and get a classical bit out? So that's the, like what Bob would be doing. And then, yeah, this is just kind of, combining all those through. I encourage you guys after this, or if like throughout the day, if you have time to go and look through even through like the next week or so to, when you're kind of reflecting on this, to look through this and try to see how does your understanding of quantum key distribution line up with what's going on here. This is kind of like the, this does go through all of the set. So you can see that there's a noise model that's initialized. The assert at the top is really just asserting that the number of verified bits is less than the number of bits divided by two, so verifying bits as like the section of the key that you're releasing. And then the number, just because of, you don't want to be releasing more verified bit, more bits than the key has just for like syntactic problems. And then you can see that Alice is generating her bits based on just random numbers and generating random bases with a random number generator. You're encoding the message. And then if there's a listener, then Eve is intercepting the message. And then Bob is generating his bases. He's measuring the bits that Alice sent. And then they try, like they get rid of all of the different bits that you have. So you can see those kind of the progression of that through the code. And then they can release. And then you can see the key. And then you can if you can see whether or not the key, like the samples are the same, and whether or not your communication has been successful. Yeah. So then, if you just want to scroll down a bit, yeah. So this is just initializing sound of constants for the system. So if you want to, the bit length is the number of bits that the key has. So if you guys want to deal with that, you can basically have more longer or shorter things, the validation length of the number of bits. So that's basically how many bits are released uh, so that they can compare. So I encourage you guys for that to kind of play around with if there is a listener, which is kind of determined by the Boolean listener variable, it, it you would kind of have, like you can see, are they discovered when you're only releasing five bits? Are they discovered less often when you're releasing like 50? And you can kind of play around with that for sure. And then the noise is kind of, is just a, a, a value. So you can, it's going to be a, a value between zero and one, and you can change it. We're, we're going to leave it at zero for just the purposes of this, just so we, but you guys, I encourage you guys to, once you 
have the completed code that we'll put up there, or once you've filled it in yourself to go through and look at what noise does. So no, noise is essentially just, it's just a probability. So of how often gates happen. So if you have a noise of 0.5, half of the things are going to, half of like the operations that are done induce a, uh, an error. So probably a good number would kind of be like 0 0.01 or 0 0.05 along with a pretty reasonable value of noise. So yeah, this is the unfinished portion now. So we'll just go through, I guess, a bit of kind of coding. So we have a, this is kind of syntactically a quantum circuit that is defining Qiskit. You can basically create baits, gates using like a Q.x creates an X gate like that you guys saw and or poly X gate. And then a q.h adds a Hadamard gate. And the qubit number in the middle is really just kind of what number of qubit you want to apply. For us, it's always just going to be like the zeroth qubit or the, fir the fir like the first, because all of these are single qubit systems. And then, but in a, like a more complex system, you could have multiple qubits that you want to see which one you actually apply to. Apply to. And then, yeah, the q dot measure kind of goes through and just that's measuring the value of a qubit to the value of a classical bit number. So definitely, these are just kind of the three things. There's a lot more syntax that you can have for quantum computing, but these are the three main ones that we'll use here. And another note is that this is has capability of visualization. That's all been imported. So once you guys kind of, have, you'll do some visualization stuff tomorrow. So you can also go through and visualize what these qubits will look like and what the like the circuits that are constructing them would look like after the fact. So I guess. Yeah, we're just running out of a little bit of time. I guess my technical issues are, are causing that, so I apologize. But I guess we can do the encode code qubit. I'll briefly first, and I'll just briefly go through exactly kind of what would happen. So you can see if a base is Z, so if you're you're wanting to encode something in the Z basis, so you can think, what do I want to have happen? So I don't need to do any like translations of Hadbert gates to translate to another basis because it's already in the Z basis. And then if it's a one, well, we can just the Z basis is normally qubits are set to zero. So we have to then apply an X gate, which is gonna flip it to a one. So you can just do Q dot X at zero. And then else, otherwise, if the basis is in the X, then we're gonna to need to apply, once again, a Q, a Q dot, a Q dot eight. Yeah, we're gonna to need to apply a Q, like a Q dot X, sorry about that. <laughs> But yeah, we're going to need to apply like a Q dot X and then a Q dot H and then a Q dot H after just to translate it into that section to that section. And just for the syntax mind, you may want to put the Q dot H into like right above the like kind of in the outer layer of that, just so it applies to all the bits, not just if the bit is one, because you're going to need to translate into the into the X basis, regardless of whether or not the bit is one. Yeah, and there, so that's kind of all that's needed. Yeah, that's all that's needed for a for the encoding. So you can kind of look through and think, how does my understanding of how the system works look relate to what the code actually looks like? But yeah, Matt, that that should be good for the encode qubit. And then we can go up to the measure one and just quickly, it's a similar process. So essentially, if the basis in Z is Z, well, you assume that the qubit is already in the Z basis. So then you can just do it like a Q dot measure, Q dot like Q dot measure and zero zero like kind of measuring the zeroth quantum bit and storing it in the zeroth classical bit. Yeah, and master showing the syntax. And otherwise, if the basis is an X, in order to measure in the X basis, you have to apply a hardware gate to essentially, it's essentially assuming that it's the qubit in the X basis. So if you apply a hardware gate to it, you bring it to the Z basis, and then you can accurately measure it. And then you can do a Q dot measure on zero, zero. And Matt, if you now run, I think if you run all the code now, that's it should now be able to, at the bottom at least, produce. Yeah, the key is communicated set successfully. So you can see that even though we had a key length of 100, out of those only 50, like 50% 50 on average, are going to have the same basis. So they're going to, only 50 of them are going to be part of the key. And then we release 15 bits to check. So even though we specified a thing of uh, like a, a length of 100, we actually have 50 kind of minus 15, give or take a few for just because it's, it is like, obviously not, it is 50%, but that doesn't like mean it is exactly 50, 50, but yeah, you can see that we have a, a key that is 37 bits long. That would be completely secure. So yeah, that's everything for this workshop. We'll post the updated, like the finished code. Um, we'll like pull, pull that to the GitHub.
so that you guys can see them. We, we indeed, yeah. We, I apologize for any, all the technical issues, but for sure, if you guys have questions about this, be free to message me on Slack or I, I think, or like email me or things like that, or I'll stick around here for another like kind of 10 minutes or five minutes to answer questions that I have, anyone has, but I think I'll let you guys go just because I know everyone's going to want lunch and there's a fairly packed day, but for sure, that's thanks you guys for all coming and welcome to Disruptive Tech. I'm very excited that you're all here and I hope you guys learned a bit about quantum computing and obviously from that session, a bit about an introduction to blockchain and a bit about and quantum. Thank you, Spencer. <clears throat> that was incredible. Um, yeah, so we're going to take a lunch break right now, I believe. Um, so I'll see you guys in how long? At 1.30 um, for Grover's algorithm. And it, I'd say it's worth checking out the, the GitHub and trying to clone the repo and trying to trying to run along as we as we work through. If you don't know how to do that, that's that's fine. You can we'll we'll figure something out. But have yeah. a good lunch. Yeah, the, the GitHub does have instructions on it. Like if you just go to the website, like on the front page, it has instructions that uh, have been made by like the people that made it and that organize all all the the work for stuff to on how you could on how you should go about kind of making a fork of it and getting the local copies so that you can work on it. So all that information, like I know that when I joined QMind, I had no idea how to do anything at all. So uh, there is a lot of information about that and a lot of stuff online as well. If you guys need help with that. Awesome. Thank you, Spencer. Yeah, and otherwise, if anyone has questions, feel free to shoot them in the chat. Oh, yeah, so what are some of the challenges quantum key distribution has? Yeah, for sure. No, that's a very good question. So obviously, with a practical implementation, um, error becomes a big issue because having error and having a system, there, it's always going to be difficult because you're trying to communicate like a secret key. So it's if there's error, you don't want to release too much of the key and things like that. It's also just with the practical imp implementation, there becomes physical restrictions like this is something that is definitely a theme within quantum computing is that it's such a new technology that it's we're still in the development phase of learning how how many qubits can we actually make and how can we make a quantum computer with that and so that's that's something that is not like quantum key distribution is not like immune to that there are still issues with like how long can you send a qubit like how far can you send it on a communication channel before it kind of like loses all before it has like a high chance of losing its information. Because if you're sending like a photon of light, there's going to be every time it, every time it like reflects off of whatever like fiber optic cable you're using, there's going to be some chance of it kind of like either being absorbed or like the information changing. So there are kind of like physical issues with it. But as for the actual like security of it as a system, it's, it's, it is theoretically secure, which is interesting. I think it's very interesting that something so simple as this, if you release the sufficient amount of the keys, it is theoretically secure. So for the challenges that it has in terms of like the physical limitations and restrictions, things like that, it is still a very interesting and a powerful system, certainly. Oh, so essentially the, the discarding of the information. Yeah, so he doesn't know what Alice sent but they'll release portions of the key to each other. So if you have a key length of 100, you release, they, I think they, in the coding example, they released 15 bits of that. So they release kind of, you release 15 bits and then you can see based on those, they release, they both release those. So they can see they, they can compare them to each other on like an unsecured channel even and see if those are the same, just because of the, because of the like principles of measurement, if Eve is only, can't only measure like some, a subset or is, is not going to only, wouldn't gain any information by measuring only a subset of the bits. So if any, all of it's been tampered with, you'll be able to see that even as, in a subset of the key. But yeah, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, I, definitely to clarify that, because that's a very important step is kind of that when they release those, they kind of, they know and they, you can understand and you'd see whether or not it's been secure or whether it's been tampered with.
For sure. And yeah, like, like I said, definitely even after this, if you have questions after the fact or when you're like kind of playing with around the code, you have questions, definitely take a look at the workbook, take a look at like the completed code and kind of, because it has all of the information that we went through today. And you can also definitely, there's a lot of great resources online. If you guys want any, I can point you in the direction of them, but there's definitely a lot of further reading that can be done in this topic if you guys are interested in it, because I know it is even, it's definitely not something I could do justice in in just 40 minutes. Yes. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that David. So yeah, that's kind of, that is one of the points that you could also see the 15 bits, but essentially the idea is that when you're only releasing a small subset of the key, you still have, you would then not basically not, not use those 15 bits for secret communications. Those would be used as more of a verification. So then Eve can see the 15 bits and would be able to see that they're exchanging those, but those bits wouldn't give any other additional information to the rest of the key, which then they would know whether or not it's secure. So yeah, that is, that's a very good point and a good clarification to make is that, yeah, that is all along an unsecure channel. So they would be able to see those bits, but it's certain it, that doesn't actually affect the security of the rest of the key. All right, well, it, it looks like there aren't too many other questions. So I, uh, I think I'll, I will head off, but certainly if you guys do have questions moving forward, feel free to hit me up on Slack or shoot me an email. I'm sure I'd be happy to answer them or point in the direction of someone that can't answer them. But yeah, enjoy, enjoy your lunch break. I think we'll see you back at here, here fairly soon.